<clears throat> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and welcome back to our fiqh class. We are doing the kitab known as Ala al Sunan of Mulana Zafar Ahmad Tanbi, Rahimullah. And tonight, inshallah, we are starting from a new chapter, still in the chapters of Tahara. We are starting from page 296, and without any delays, let's begin. Bismillahi wa alhamdulillahi wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. So last week we had done the chapter on the uh, saliva of human beings and the leftover of human beings being pure, even if the person uh, is a kafir and or a mushrik or whatever, his najasa, or at least his saliva is not deemed as being najis, unless of course he was eating something uh, which was najis, he was drinking some wine and so on and so, on and so forth. But generally, in general, saliva is pure and you also come to understand this from a marital concept uh, you know uh, uh, there's always an exchange of such things so therefore it, if it was najis then such things would be impermissible so you understand from various things that the default ruling of all human beings is that saliva is a clean thing and not something which is impure. So you find, like I said, the spitters, they speak and they spit on you. So if the spit happens to fall on you, it's not something which is impure that now you must go and uh, uh, by necessity wash it off you and things like that. Like if a dog came and it happened to uh, lick your hand or whatever, you, by, you are required to wash it off because it's impure. Anyway, let's begin the new chapter. The chapter with regards to the leftovers of donkeys and wild animals. Siba, it means literally, we say wild animal, literally it means those animals which have fangs. So lions and tigers and panthers and cheetahs and uh, lynx and you know, all those sort of stuff, those type of creatures. And donkeys as well. Donkeys are not wild uh, animals going out there and chomping on people, but they you'll understand why as we move on so starting from the first narration hadith number 263 an abi qatada radiyallahu anhu anna rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qala innaha laysat bi najisin inma hiya min at-tawafin alaykum aw at-tawafat rawahu at-tirmidhi wa qala hasan sahih wa qad marra fi al-bab as-sabiq we just did this hadith this is only a portion of it the hadith of hadrat abu qatada abu qatada radiyallahu anhu we did this two weeks ago under the chapter of cats because this hadith relates to a cat that in Naha, it, it is not impure, meaning cats. Cats are not uh, najis, they are from the tawafina alaykum awit tawafa. They are from those male and female creatures that uh, are in and out of your houses. Imam Tirmidhi rahimullah reports this hadith and he grades it as being authentic and he says we passed it by in the previous chapter. So, how does this hadith relate to this chapter over here? The, what he what he's bringing here, what Malana Zafar Ahmad Tanvi, why he's quoting this hadith is to show you that he's basically saying that uh, because cats are things that live in your house in and out, lions and those sort of things, they don't live in your houses. Donkeys don't live in your houses. Well, some people may have their pet donkey, but you know, it's never been a norm for people to be living in houses with donkeys. Yeah, your donkey stays outside. If your donkey puts his head through your window, maybe it's to, get, to steal your apple, but they don't love in people's houses. But the cat, he jumps in by your window, he walks in by your door. Some even open that door handle and, and walk in. So they are in and out of a person's house. Then you find him under your bed. Then he's sitting on your bed. Then he's sitting on your chair. Then he's clawing your curtains. But 
you know, they have that sort of uh, personality that they are always in your house. So in a, we can go deep in this uh, issue from a fiqhi perspective, you know, for haja and darura and the various opinions of the ulama, but we'd spend all night just speaking about how cats come into people's houses. So we're going to skip by all of that and just simply uh, suffice by saying that he brought this to show you that the animals which are living in your houses like this, they are, they are deemed as being pure. Those that don't belong in the houses, they generally are the impure ones. It's not a general rule. The general rule of fiqh actually is that the animals that are eaten, so your cows, your camels, your sheep, your goats, your chickens, for example, these are animals whose meat are eaten, as a result of which their saliva is pure. So if you happen to have your Mary with your little lamb over there, and you have your little lamb which comes inside your house there and things, they are not, uh, you know, if they lick you, for example, while you're feeding them, maybe they'll chew your hands, but I mean, they not nudges. So if they lick your hand over there while you're feeding your horse some sugar, it's not impure. If you're, uh, you know, you're feeding some lettuce leaves to your uh, a goat over there, it's not impure. But if you are feeding your dog and your dog happened to lick you, it's impure. If you are feeding a lion, Okay, well, the lion's not a good and you will probably chew your hand off, but you, you get the picture. Their saliva is pure, these ones are not. But we'll get to that when we get to that point, inshallah. Let's move on to the actual hadith now. Hadith number 264. Jabir ibn Abdullah other Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu he said that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prohibited on the day of Khaybar the meat of donkeys and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave permission for eating the meat of horses now before we move further I'll speak on this point from a uh, fiqh perspective since after all we are doing hadith but we're doing mainly fiqh so obviously we need to understand the fiqh of everything so the day of Khaybar, this is when the, the bat, after the battle of Khaybar, when the Jews of Khaybar were defeated and the Muslims had taken some of the meat over there and they cook, were cooking it in the pots and everything of the sort and the prohibition came in that donkey meat is prohibited. So the, you know, the pots had to be turned over, they couldn't eat it and everything. So Previously, like with uh, alcohol and certain things, prohibition only came in later on. So it was on that day of Khaybar that the prohibition uh, came in for eating donkey meat. Now you have Humur uh, al-Ahliya and Humur al-Wahshi, a wild donkey as people call it, which is an, actually an onager. Uh, is the name of it uh, O-N-A-G-E-R if you uh, I suppose there's, you can take it in South Africa, there's a, a creature which is, so to say, almost extinct. Uh, he's known in South Africa as a kwacha. You may find some uh, white people, uh, Africans, and they actually call kwachas, but a kwacha was a real animal. He is a real animal if they're not entirely extinct. But you can search, you can go to Google, and you can look at what a kwacha is, K-W-A-G-G-A. Quachas. So a quacha is like an onega. They are this type which are known as belonging to the family of donkeys. So they look like a little bit of a weird horse type creature. But like I say, check the pictures yourself and you'll know what it is. So that is what is known as a uh, wild donkey. And a wild one like this here was deemed as being permissible to eat. So you, the, on account of this, you find some ulama also calling it a zebra. But I, even though a zebra can fall in as being amongst the permissible animals to eat, but it's not the one spoken of in the hadith because zebras don't exist in Arabia. But onegas, they did exist over there. They lived there. So uh, you, you can't come and say, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said it's permissible to eat zebra. When there weren't zebras over there, the creature thus that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was speaking about was an onega. So anyway, that's from that aspect. So the homo uh, ahliya, the domesticated donkeys, the donkeys that exist and they actually go around with you, you ride on it, you carry your, your goods on it and so on and so forth. They, then you don't eat them. But now comes the next point from a Hanafi perspective. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave permission to eat horses. You know, I'm so hungry, I could eat a horse. 
Well, generally you can actually, if, uh, if you are uh, speaking from a fiqh perspective, that you're so hungry, you can eat a horse. Now, from a Hanafi perspective, we say that it is makruh to eat horses. For what reason? The reason we say from a Hanafi perspective that a person should not be eating horses is because horses are what were used for jihad. People never went into jihad on donkeys. You know, you don't have your team of cavalry and everybody's coming on a donkey, on a donkey over there. Yeah, yeah, it never happened. You would have your horsemen, the four donkey riders of the apocalypse, don't exist. You have the four horse, one of the ap apocalypse. You don't have a knight, your knight in shining armor, and he's riding on a donkey. It don't work that way. People ride, rode on horses in jihad. Camels as well, but the cavalry have always only ever been on horseback. So uh, when the Mujahideen used to go out, the Sahaba radiallahu anhu, uh, flying through the rank, cutting down left, right, and center, turning around, turning uh, uh, right flank, left flank, uh, all these sort of things, they were the cavalry on horseback. Now, if everybody were to go around cutting up their uh, horses and eating them, it would have led to a uh, shortage of animals for the purpose of jihad. After all, remember, they want 400,000 uh, horses all over the place. Even in today's world, horses are scarce in, for all intents and purposes. So therefore we said, no, you shouldn't eat horses. Le keep them for jihad. You got enough cows and sheep and stuff to eat. Leave these ones alone. But if a person did happen to eat, uh, to slaughter a horse, maybe the horse was old and going to die. So you decided, hey, let's cut him up and make some chops and cutlets. Then yes, from a, a fiqh perspective, even according to the Hanafi Mahab, it will be permissible to eat it. So yes, if you happen to be so hungry that you can eat a horse, you actually can eat your horse. So if you happen to find yourself riding on a horse out there in the wilderness and you have no food, maybe you're in the desert somewhere and now somebody stole your goods, so you have no food, you're going to die. So you decide, hey, you know what, I'll kill my horse and I'll eat him up then, well, you are permitted to do it. It will be permissible. It's not like it's some haram thing. So our prohibition to, or at least I should say, our discouraging people from eating horses is not from the point of it being haram, but from a point of it not uh, diminishing the amount of uh, horses that will be available for people to use in jihad. That's actually the real reason behind it. So in essence, horse meat is permissible. Shouldn't be done for the purpose of jihad, but the meat itself is permissible. So while the Shafi'i or, or the other Malahib, they would say, there's no harm, you can eat the horse. So if they happen to have their horse and he slaughtered it and he's uh, put it on the braai there, you can eat, the, you can help him eat his horse. It won't be a problem. Allah knows best. Let's move on. Hadith number 265. وَلَهُ مِنْ رِوَايَةِ بْنِ عُمَرَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمَا نَهَا النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ عَنْ لُحُومِ الْحُمُرِ الْأَهْلِيَّةِ يَوْمَ خَيْبَرَ It comes in the narration of Hadrat Abdullah ibn Umar رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمَا that Nabi صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ prohibited the eating of the meat of domesticated ahliya. I explained yet previously that it refers to domesticated donkeys, the donkeys that you have normally around, not the onegas and those type of things. Doesn't mean you have to keep a donkey in your house, in your yard, for it to be domesticated. We know what are donkeys. That's why we call them by different names. One is being a donkey, one is being an onega, quaha, uh, you know, different, different things of the sort. We call them by those names to distinguish them from the donkey that is the normal types that we refer to as donkeys on your donkey a donkey cart and things of that sort the, it's there so the what was prohibited was these normal donkeys and not that onega and uh, quaha and those type of creatures but we did that previously so there's no need to repeat that point again Let's move on to hadith number 266. Akhbarna Malikun, Akhbarna Yahya ibn Muhammad, and Muhammad ibn Ibrahim ibn al Harith al Taymi, and Yahya ibn Abd rahman ibn Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a, Radiallahu Anu, and Umar ibn al Khattab, Radiallahu Anu, Kharaja fi Rakbin, Fihim Amr ibn al As, Radiallahu Anu, Hatta Waradu, Houdan, Fakala Amr ibn al As, Radiallahu Anu, Ya Sahib al Houd, Halta Rudda Houdak al Sibar. فقال عمر بن الخطاب رضي الله عنه يا صاحب الحوض لا تخبرنا فإنا نرد على السباع نرد على السباع وترد علينا أخرج محمد في الموطة وسنده صحيح إلا أن فيه انقطاعا فإن يحيى لم يدرك عمر والانقطاع لا يضرنا 
Okay, so long story short, uh, Imam Malik uh, in, uh, narrates from Imam Yahya ibn Muhammad, from Muhammad ibn Ibrahim ibn al Harith the Taymi, from Yahya ibn Abdul Rahman ibn Hatib. Uh, he's Yahya ibn Abdul Rahman ibn Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a. Adrat Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a radiallahu anhu wa sahabi. This is his grandson, Yahya ibn Abdul Rahman, who's narrating it to uh, Imam uh, Ibrahim ibn Muhammad uh, ibn al Harith the Taymi. But anyway, so grandson of Hadrat Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a radiallahu anhu, who narrates, says that Hadrat Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu went out one day fi Raqbin amongst a group of Sahaba on uh, traveling on, on uh, horseback, camel, etc., on animals. And amongst the Sahaba was Hadrat Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhuma, hatta waradu al-Hawdan until they came across a pond. And Hadrat Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu, he said, oh, owner of the pond, uh, do uh, wild animals come and drink from your pond over here? Hadrat Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he interjected, he said, oh, owner of the pond, don't tell us, la tukhbirna, don't tell us about this, because we pass the wild animals and they pass us, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter, so don't tell us about this. Uh, in any case, a person can take a hadith in this regard. And uh, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu قال سئل رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم عن الماء وما ينوبه من الدواب والسباع فقال إذا كان الماء قلتين لم يحمل الخبثة رواه الخمسة والنساء والدار قطني etc etc as the other Imam reports hadith so. Uh, in this hadith, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, the one I just narrated to you, not from the kitab here, uh, Imam Nasai rahimahullah, the narrator of this hadith, he says that uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked with regards to water. And وَمَا يَنُوبُهُ مِنَ الدَّوَابِ وَالسِّبَاعِ The animals, wild ones and others who come and drink from it. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِذَا كَانَ الْمَاءُ قُلَّتَيْنِ لَمْ يَحْمِلِ الْخَبْثَ That when water has reached uh, the point of being قُلَّتَيْن then it does not become impure. So we did touch on previously the topic of Qullatain, uh, that it's a huge quantity of water. You can uh, refer back to the previous classes which have been uploaded on YouTube in the Darul Ilm uh, channel, uh, in the Ayala Sunan playlist. You can search there for Qullatain and inshallah you'll come across that particular masala. But anyway, so when water reaches the amount of being Qullatain, which is generally in the case of ponds and things of the sort, then it doesn't become impure uh, by even though the saliva of a wild animal is impure, but because it's a huge quantity of water, it doesn't become impure by this little bit of a uh, uh, lion coming to drink from the watering hole. So for, for that reason. So that hadith, uh, authentic hadith from uh, uh, Sunan al-Nasai, uh, from Adat Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, and here you see Adat Umar radiallahu anhu saying the same thing. You don't have to tell us because whether they come or they don't come, it doesn't make a difference because there's sufficient water over here. It's qullatain. So if they did come and drink, it's neither here nor there. And if they didn't come and drink, it's neither here nor there. So the water is pure. We can use of it. We can make wudu with it. We can drink from it. It's not a problem. So in other words, if you happen to be out one day on a safari and you come out there and you find a watering hole and the village beers and the lions and them all are not currently over there and you come and you make your wudu over there and you drink from it, the water will be deemed as being pure. So... That's how you can apply that masala in your practical life because that's what the closest you're going to get to being around wild animals in any case. So Imam Muhammad rahimahullah reports it in his muwatta. It's the muwatta of Imam Malik periwayat in Imam Muhammad ibn al-Hasan al-Shaybani rahimahullah. This is Imam Muhammad of the Hanafi madhab. He's the narrator of the muwatta. He studied by Imam Malik after Imam Abu Hanif rahimahullah passed away. So in his version of the muwatta, this hadith is reported and his chain of narration is authentic. Except illa anna fihi inqita'an. There's one point of inqita' meaning there's somebody missing from the chain because Yahya, Yahya ibn Abdul Rahman, Ibn Abi Hatib, Ibn Abi Balta, uh, this person who is the grandson of the Sahabi Hadrat Hatib, he is narrating that Adr Umar radiallahu anhu went out, but he never met Adr Umar radiallahu anhu in his life. So obviously somebody is missing. But he says, in Qita' for us as Ahnaf, it's not a problem. So who did, was he leaving out? He was leaving out, for example, one of the senior tabi'in. He was leaving out maybe another sahabi. So in that case, obviously, he's not a... Uh, if he didn't meet other Umar, which means another sahabi uh, narrated it to him, or... Uh, tabi'i who met Hadrat Umar radiallahu anhu narrated it to him. So one way or the other, he's a senior tabi'i 
or he's a Sahabi. So that person being missing, not named in the chain, doesn't affect the authenticity of it. That's basically what he's telling you. Okay, let's do or at least one more hadith. أخبرنا أبو حنيفة عن حماد عن إبراهيم قال لا خير في سؤر البغل والحمار ولا يتوضأ أحد بسؤر البغل والحمار ويتوضأ من سؤر الفرس والبرذون والشاة والبعير أخرجه محمد في الآثار وسنده صحيح قال وهو قول أبي حنيفة وبه نأخذ <تصفيق> Okay, so here we're doing a pure Hanafi hadith, you know, uh, for a person who don't have connection so much with the Hanafi mother, Dalil and stuff like this here, this is a bit of a retreat, let's call it this. In reality, there are many, but it's just that people don't have that much connection with the Hanafi uh, Dal Dalail to be able to know, uh, let's put it this way, the the a hadith from a Hanafi perspective. So this is Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah himself narrating a hadith from Imam Hamad. You know, you always hear about Imam Abu Hanifa's teacher, Imam Hamad, Imam Hamad. This is Imam Hamad. Who narrates from who? Imam Ibrahim. Who's Imam Ibrahim? It's Imam Ibrahim al Nakhai, one of the great uh, Imam of the Tabi'een. And he says, La khaira fi su'ri al baghli wal himar. There's no goodness in the leftovers of a a mule and a donkey and do not make wudu from none of you should make wudu with the leftover water of a mule or a donkey now you'll find in the books of fiqh that uh, a donkey and a mule are deemed as being mashkuk meaning doubtful on account of the fact that for example a mule and donkey are they pure impure their saliva you know that sort of thing so for that reason uh, you don't make wudu if they came and they drank from a bowl of water you don't uh, use it for wudu let's put it this way back in the old days in the uh, in the wild west and people were riding on their horses and they come and they tie their horse up by the saloon and the horse there's that uh, uh what you call it not a moat but you know that uh with a thing for the horses to drink some water in now, that piece of uh, wood where they, they store the water, so the horses drink over there. So obviously they don't drink all the water, so there's water left inside it. So if the, you had it and there were only horses tied up over there drinking the water, you can literally go and drink also from that water, you can go and make wudu from that water. But if somebody came along with a donkey and he tied his donkey there and the donkey drank from that water, that in that case, because it's a small quantity of water, you don't make, you can't make wudu with it, you can't drink the water. That's how you come to understand these masail from a practical perspective. So you don't make wudu with the leftovers uh, or from water where a donkey or a mule has drank. And waya tawadda, there's no harm if you make wudu from the water which has been drank from by a horse and a birdhawn. A birdhawn is like a type of horse, like a work workhorse. One is a faras. Now, horses is a big thing in, in Arabic, like lions. So you get like many, many, many names. Camels, horses, uh, lions have got a lot of names in Arabic. If a, a lion is uh, looking like he's frowning, if he's, uh, if, he, if he's a frowning one, it's called Abbas. Abbas is a frowning lion. You've got a, a, a shibble. It's a small one. You've got, you know, you've got the different names uh, like this for lions and you've got different names for horses so you've got the faras you've got the khayl you, you know you've got different things like this so for every different type so you had the fancy full fast uh, horse that makes you uh, a knight on the battlefield that's the faras and then you've got the birdown which is like your you know people may call it a nag the old nag that type of horse that's a birdown so if that type of horse uh, drinks from water or a shark meaning a sheep or a bair which is a, a, would, be, would be now your camels and your cows and those type of uh, creatures if they come and drink from the water there's no harm you can make wudu with it their saliva is pure so the water is not a problem that's basically what we are getting from this hadith imam muhammad ibn al hassan al shaybani rahimahullah he reports in his kitab al athar kitab al athar is a book of hadith written by imam muhammad rahimahullah uh, a hadith and obviously the fiqh of it all 
the chain of narration is authentic and Imam Muhammad now say this is the viewpoint of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, and we uh, agree with it and in other words and this is our view as the Hanafi Madhab that you don't make wudu with the leftovers from a donkey or a mule you don't drink the leftover water but you can drink the leftover water from a horse a camel a cow and a sheep no harm in it Okay, let's move on one more. We can do ibn Umar radiallahu anhu kana yakrahu not bikurhi kana yakrahu su'ru al-himari wal-kalbi wal-hirri ayyata wadda'a bifadlihi akhrajahu abdul razaq fi musannafihi kultu lam aqifu ala sanadihi mufassalan wa innama dhakartuhu i'ati does it suppose be i'ati dadan not i'ati sadan the Okay, I suppose that was probably a bad uh, cut out of a dot that should have been a dot. I'ati dadan. Abud. Abud literally means your upper arm, but it means I'ati dad as strength. But anyway, let's read the narration. Imam Nafi', the freed slave of Hadrat Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, he narrates that Hadrat Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu used to dislike the, left the leftover water of a donkey, a dog, a cat. Okay, a cat, a dog, and a donkey. He disliked that you should make wudu with their leftover. The fadl, we did also about fadl, uh, fadl al-ma previously as well. So, uh, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu used to dislike that you make wudu with their leftovers. So, Imam Abdul Razak, uh, rahimahullah, reports in, in his musannaf, musannaf Abdul Razak. Mulana Zafar Ahmad Thani, he says, I never came across the, the full sanad of this hadith, but I mentioned this hadith here, just to add extra strength to what has been mentioned previously. <coughs> Okay, so uh, we know already the point of the Surul Himar. The okay, we have three essential different different things over here. Surul Himar, the leftovers of a donkey. We call it Mashkuk earlier, doubtful. So we understand him. We did three weeks ago. We touched on the ruling on the dogs. Dogs, we said was impure. So we've got doubtful. We've got impure, and then we've got the hir. Why is a cat also included in, included in here? What was mentioned is that the ruling regarding a cat is that it is pure, but if the cat happened to have drank uh, or eaten at least a mouse or something, and it come with blood now, then it makes it impure. That's one. Another opinion could be uh, that this is not the the hir really, but the sinur, and we did touch on the sinur also previously, which is a wild cat. Those little... Uh, cats but the one which live in the wild uh, you know if you talk wild cat people think lions and tigers and those sort of stuff but you talk about those little ones you know they got like tufts of uh, of uh, hair on the 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 tips of their ears those type of wild ones so uh, that's one possibility but otherwise we would say that it refers to in a case where the a uh, cat has just eaten, gone out there, eaten uh, some mouse or something, and come now with blood and just drink from the water. So in that case, you shouldn't use the water. But if not, then as you saw previously, two weeks ago in our class, we touched on the ruling on cats, and the, the ruling is that the leftover water from them is indeed pure. Okay, we have time to do the last one because it's something we have done. So we can do one final one for the tonight. And Abi Thalaba, Radiallahu Anu Kala, Haruma Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Luhuma Lahumuri Lahliya, Rawal Bukhari. That Abu Thalaba, Radiallahu Anu, he said, Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, declared the meat of domesticated donkeys to be haram. Now we did previously two different hadith on the topic. That it was prohibited on the day of Khaybar. After the Battle of Khaybar, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the prohibition on eating uh, domesticated donkeys had been revealed at that point in time. So the, from that point onwards, eating uh, donkeys became haram. So the meat of domesticated donkeys is haram. Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah, the narrator of this hadith. We'll stop on this point here for tonight, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, because our time is just about up for the class as well. So we'll end here for now. Until next time we end. And we say, wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Subhanallahi wa bihamdihi. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.